so thanks for coming. Um, as Barney said, I am here not just to do a talk about the project, but to gather information. Um, and as I talk about the project, you'll kind of see we're still in our early stages. But having worked as a researcher on place names for the past five years, I am very aware of the fact that very much the local communities and the local people can tell us more about their um, localities and the different stories and the histories behind the localities than we could ever learn sitting up in Queens looking at dusty books and maps. So it's very much going to be a two-way conversation. As I go through the talk this evening, stick up your hand, wave over if you want to ask me any questions or stop me if anything isn't clear. Um, it's going to be kind of informal and as Barney said, there's going to be an opportunity to chat, ask questions at the end, um, get a cup of tea and um, exchange contact information because we're planning that this will be the first of, of a series of collaborations with Barney and the wider projects that he's got going on down here in Fermanagh. So, talking places, um, the Ordnance Survey in Fermanagh 200 years on. So the reason um, that this project is happening at the minute is that we're approaching the bicentenary of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland. And what this project, I'm going to talk a bit about more in a second, um, we're really exploring the legacy of the Ordnance Survey as we come up to the 200 years since it was carried out here in Ireland. Um, and we're here in Fermanagh, and I've got a particular reason for looking at Fermanagh in a bit more detail, um, that it, and I'll tell you why um, shortly. So Barney's already introduced me. This is going to be a really quick slide. It's really a disclaimer to say that I'm not a geographer, I'm not a historian, I'm a linguist. So I get interested in, uh, well, I got involved in this project through my previous work with the Northern Ireland Placing Project, which you may or may not have heard of. So the, our reason for this project is to um, discover the origins of our local place names um, in whatever language. So we know that the majority of our place names are of Irish language origin, but have been anglicised, so very much different beasts to the names that they were when they were coined when Irish was spoken throughout Ireland. So the reason that this project exists is to, I suppose, look backwards and try and figure out the original form of the Irish name and then beyond that, um, exploring how that name maybe connects to localities or people that would have um, been prominent in the districts at the time. So I'll maybe come back a different time and talk about place names because that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. But just to bring to your attention, we have a website um, at placenamesni.org. You can search for a townland name, county, barish, parish, um, barony, minor names, so names of physical features. Um, and we have a database that goes back um, some of the... So when you look up a place name, it will give you the contemporary place name but it will also give you historical forms of the name as they've been gathered in the last nearly 40 years of the project. So if they've appeared in patents or on historical maps or anything, you'll be able to, to look at the timeline of the name and see how it's changed over time. Um, if you're looking at a timeline, you'll also see a little blurb about the elements of the name. So that's our website. Um, and we're also on Twitter. Um, we tweet kind of small bits of information about place names. So that's my other work. Um, and also a, the disclaimer that I, I don't know very much about geography or history, but I have some maps that I'll, I'll gloss over and you might be able to help me with some of those um, in a local context. So the plan for this evening's talk, if I get through it, um, I don't think I've got the time here. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the Ordnance Survey and the um, significance of Kulka and this local area for the Ordnance Survey, both 200 years ago and now as we explore the legacy of the Ordnance Survey. I'm going to talk a little bit about OS 200, which is the name of the project that I'm working on at the minute. Um, then I'm going to expand on one of the themes of the project, which is talking places, and that will become more relevant as we get there. And then, as Barney said, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, tell me what I've said wrong when I've been up here, and give me some feedback, and we'll get a cup of tea and a chat at the end. So that's the way it's going to go. So when we're thinking about place and place names and maps, it's important sometimes just to think back to the very beginning and when um, Ireland was first mapped. And the first map of Ireland was actually um, drawn by or plotted by a Greek astronomer and cartographer called Claudius Ptolemy. Um, and it dates back to around 140 AD. So this is the very first map of Ireland that is in existence. We know that he didn't come to Ireland, we're pretty sure he didn't come to Ireland, but what Claudius Ptolemy did was that he plotted coordinates of a map of, map of the countries across the world using resources of the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt. Um, so based on the writings of other astronomers, mathematicians and geographical writers that had come before him. So he pulled this all together. 
So if you see this map, it's actually quite accurate given the fact that he didn't come here. Um, you might not be able to see because it's, it's a bit bright in here, but we can actually identify some of the place names on the map. So if we see here uh, Logia, um, which is actually the, the lagon, um, there are some other ones in there. Maybe I'll come back another day and talk about, about Ptolemy's map. But this is where mapping of Ireland started um, in Greece. So, well, we know this dates to 140 AD. The earliest surviving manuscript or replication of this map of Ireland dates from the 13th century. So that was Ptolemy. That's where we started. As time went on, the um, reasons and the motivations for um, mapping Ireland changed. And a real busy time for maps being drawn of Ireland was the time of the 17th century within the context of war and dispossession. So in a context when um, land needs to be identified for transfer to another individual, they need to be able to write it down. Who owns it? Who's it going to be going to? What's it called? And also alongside the information about the value of the land. So in the 17th century, we have lots of different maps that not only record place names, but um, the district sizes, um, the value of the land, the quality of the land, all those sorts of things that tells us what it's worth, um, or t told these individuals what it was worth for the purpose of passing them on to someone else. So Lord Stafford commissioned a survey of forfeited lands during his tenure in Ireland from 1633 to 1639. Um, and a really big mapping um, program was carried out by an individual on the right hand side here called William Petty who carried out what was known as the Down Survey of Ireland. So the Down Survey was established to value the lands that were confiscated during the 1640s for distribution to Cromwellian soldiers. So these maps that were made at a scale of 40 perches to one inch, so the equivalent of about one to 50,000, they were the first systematic mapping of a large area on such a scale attempted anywhere in the world. So the primary purpose, I should stop my peas. The primary purpose of these maps was to record the boundaries of each townland and calculate the areas with great precision. But these maps not only had the place names and the boundaries, they also recorded other information. Um, so buildings such as churches, roads, rivers, castles, houses and fortifications. So the 17th century was a really busy time for, for maps in Ireland. So I managed to dig out some copies. You might not be able to see them because it's a bit bright in here. So this is um, the county map of Fermanagh from the Down Survey. Now there's a website link here. If you Google Down Survey Maps, uh, Trinity University, they have a whole website and you can search the, the Down Survey Maps and you can, there's a drop down box and you can pick by county or whatever. So this is County Fermanagh. Um, if you have the time to go in and look at the website, so this is Maher Boy, um, Tier Kennedy, you might be able to identify some of the, of the place names there on, from the 17th century. And then these are some of the parish maps from the Down Survey of County Fermanagh. Um, so here we have Devonish, we have Loch Urn here at the top, um, Clan um, I'll maybe ask Barney to send these slides around after so you can have a look at them because it's kind of hard to see in the light. But Fermanagh was, was mapped in quite a bit of detail in the Down Survey. So in the run-up to the Ordnance Survey, mapping wasn't just a result of people that wanted to have maps of their area or of casual interest um, in the topo topography of the area, but it was to obtain knowledge about other peoples and to incorporate them into the system of governance and those who did the depicting and classifying. So the maps were carried out by people on the outside, not by the locals. Another cartographer that spent a lot of time in Ireland was um, a, a gentleman called Richard Bartlett. He was an Elizabethan map maker who mapped the interior of Ulster for three years, starting in 1600. So this is an example of Bartlett's map of Ulster. It's called the General Description of Ulster, and these also are, are available online. His maps were largely produced for military use in the, use in the pacifying of Ulster. Most, most of them features forts and castles. Um, and he actually followed the military campaign of um, this Baron Mountjoy. He also went further south and mapped the vital siege of Kinsale in 1601. So the map ma makers were very much following in the footsteps of where um, military advances were happening. So this is Richard Bartlett. So the locals were very suspicious of um, people coming from England and writing down their names and drawing pictures of their boundaries. So Richard Bartlett met a grisly death in Donegal. He was decapitated. In Donegal. So this is his last map, which is um, part of Donegal. So 
Um, this is a quote from a book that was written about um, Richard Bartlett, who's called The Queen's Last Mapmaker. It says, during his time in Donegal, he was captured and killed by the local people. According to Sir John Davies, writing to Robert Cecil in England, when he came to Tyrconnell, the inhabitants took off his head because they would not have their country discovered. So it just goes to show the real suspicion that people had about people coming in and writing down their maps, or writing down the names of their places. So this is the pre-context then to the Ordnance Survey. So what was the purpose of the Ordnance Survey then in Ireland? Well, in the run-up to the Ordnance, or the Ordnance Survey being carried out in Ireland, landowners in Ireland were starting to get anxious that their lands hadn't been valued properly. So taxation was levied according to old surveys calculated on the measure of land that was formerly deemed profitable and not comprehending the great improvements which had subsequently taken place. So essentially, landowners were concerned that they weren't paying the right taxes on their land. So in 1824, um, a select committee of parliament chaired by this in an individual called Thomas Spring Rice, who was an MP but also an Irish landowner, he recommended a townland survey of Ireland be carried out. And we'll come to townlands in a wee minute, but I'm sure you, you're well aware of what townlands are. So the Board of Ordnance, which was a military body responsible for mapping since 1791, they were given the job of um, mapping Ireland, <coughs> pardon me, to the scale of the townland. So they were tasked with carrying out the survey, which was led by an individual called C Colonel Thomas Colby, and then he was succeeded by um, an individual called Thomas Larkham, and we'll hear a bit about them shortly. So, Parliament said, right, you have to go to Ireland and you have to map it down to this very small scale. And when Ireland was mapped by the Ordnance Survey in the early 1900s, sorry, the 1800s, 19th century, they mapped Ireland to the scale of six inches to one mile. <coughs> so this represented the very first mapping in the entire world of a whole country at such a small scale. So um, six inches on the map is one mile um, on the land. So in terms of starting to get the maps together, what did they have to do? Well, cartographers, if there's any cartographers in the room, you'll know that the first step is to create a framework of um, trigonomical stations upon which the mapping could be based. So what they did was they um, identified the highest peaks in Ireland um, that they could triangulate or draw triangles in between. Um, and it's on this framework that they base the maps. So you should be able to see um, where are we go? Here's Kilka. So Kilka was one of the points that was chosen by the Ordnance Survey um, to build one of their principal trigonometrical stations for the mapping of Ireland. So that's where its significance comes in. Um, and then the other ones there, Sleeve League, um, Divis, there's a few there, but we'll come back to them shortly because we've got plans for those for this summer. So what these triangulation stations created was an invisible network of survey lines which connected the stations on the, Irish, on the highest points of Ireland and this is the basis on which the OS 6 inch to um, 10,000 maps were created. So I mentioned townlands previously um, and these, the Ordnance Survey were tasked with mapping down as far as the level of the townlands. So the townland is the smallest um, unit of administrative land division in Ireland. So you're probably aware of most of these terms, but if you think of um, how land units fit into each other, thanks Barney, it's kind of like a Russian doll. So your big one is your province. Within your province you have your counties, within your counties you have your baronies, which don't really get used anymore. Within your baronies you're split into parishes, and then your parishes are then split down again into individual townlands. So Townlands are an extremely old land division in Ireland, they're, they're ancient. Um, and these maps were based on the townlands, as were previous maps, um, like the Down Survey, that used the townland as the smallest unit. Townlands, um, there are over 64,000 of them in Ireland, and they're, as I said, they're one of the most ancient uh, land divisions. Today, especially if you're living in the city, the only time you'll ever probably see your townland is whenever your rates bill comes in the door because they have adopted a system of putting townlands on the rates bills. But they were originally based on an, a land division called a Ballybow, or Ballybow. Um, and if there are any Irish speakers in the room, you'll know this means the, the town or the town of a, or the space of a cow. So a Ballybow was a piece of land that provided one cow as rent. So an area of land deemed sufficient to sustain one cow. So this is why 
town lands are not uniform in size. It's not the case that town lands are so many square miles um, uniformly. The town, land depend, the town land size depends on the quality of the land. So obviously if you have poor land, your town land has to be bigger to be able to sustain a cow. So that's where the town land comes from. So I mentioned then that the Ordnance Survey, their first task was to create maps of Ireland at the scale of six inch to one mile. Pardon me, but um, if you know anything about the Ordnance Survey, we know that they didn't just create maps. So at the time of the Ordnance Survey, Colby, who was leading the Ordnance Survey um, program in Ireland, he believed that this trigonometrical sur survey, or this mapping survey, provided a foundation for statistical, antiquarian, and geological surveys. So I suppose when they were coming here and they were surveying the land in such detail, they decided to collect other things as they went along. So the Royal Engineers were asked to pay attention to the social conditions and the habits of the people, to antiquities and traditionally, traditionary recollections of all kinds, and to natural history in all its branches. So in 1832, they recruited um, civilian assistants to write memoirs, so detailed descriptions of these areas and the landscapes, and the people of the landscapes and their traditions and their customs. So social, historical, and cultural traditions. Um, their acquaintance with old customs. So these were local people that were um, often hired. So they knew the local customs, they knew the local people, they knew the local places, and their knowledge in particular of the Irish language was really useful when they could collect information. And thinking as well about poor Mr. Bartlett that lost his head in Donegal, the, in the in inhabitants of an area were much happier to talk to locals or someone who was from the area um, to tell their stories about folklore or superstitions or the value of their land or what, what jobs they did. Um, they weren't really as, as hesitant to talk to, to their peers, I suppose. So if you've ever heard of the Ordnance Survey memoirs, of all the products of the Ordnance Survey, the memoirs are in the most advanced state. So they were, um, the memoirs that were written were published by Queen's University a few years ago. And you can, you'll always see them in charity shops. I don't know why, how people come across them and end up having them in charity shops. But they've been published and they're um, freely available. Um, you probably have them in your local library as well. So what this meant was that in addition to creating these really detailed maps, the Ordnance Survey work in Ireland also involved recording an impressive range of local details. So things like folklore, antiquities, religion and topography. And for me as a linguist, it's really important that they recorded place names. But place names were recorded in a bit more detail um, as part of the Ordnance Survey, but place names definitely made their way into the Ordnance Survey memoirs. So thinking so far about the products of the Ordnance Survey, we've hit two milestones. We've got our maps and we've got our memoirs. Names then have a, another special subset of, of publications in the Ordnance Survey. So what happened was, if you think about the situation where the um, English um, employees and soldiers that had come over to Ireland, they were tasked with drawing maps, but when you're drawing maps, what do you need for the maps? You need the names, to, to write the names of the places on the maps. But thinking about Ireland at the time of um, the early 19th century, huge parts of Ireland were still predominantly Irish speaking. So you have a situation where English speakers were coming over to try and record place names from monolingual Irish speakers who couldn't speak English, very many of whom couldn't read or write. So they encountered difficulties here with the mapping. Um, orthography, documentation, and then deciding the standard forms of names. So this is due to the unfamiliarity with the, Ar unfamiliarity with the Irish language, um, which was the language origin of the vast majority of the place names. So here's a, a, a quote from um, one of the uh, documents in the time that said, Irish place names have been too variously mangled by generations of English speaking settlers for any such assumptions um, on a correct spelling to be valid. For one thing, a majority verdict might turn out to be unobtainable, as a Ballinacurra in County Cork, which is spelt with an O by five authorities and with a U by the other five. So they have this situation where they want to have these precise maps with standard forms of names, but they've encountered a real difficulty with the language and the recording of the names. So what did they do? They hired a linguist. So this. Uh, individual on the right is an individual called John O'Donovan. So John O'Donovan was uh, an Irish speaker and a linguist. He was actually the first professor of Irish at Queen's University. 
Um, and the reason they hired him is that they decided that they needed to hire a qualified linguist to, in, to be sent into the field to hear the names pronounced and interpreted by Irish speaking residents and to study them in the context of local topography and antiquities. So they hired this individual, John O'Donovan, and thought, right, he'll help us with the standardization, he'll help us with the Irish language. So at the start, he spent his time working in, um, in Dublin, in the academic libraries of Dublin, researching place names from historical documents, looking at name lists and looking at how changes happened over time in terms of place names. So the um, Ordnance Survey headquarters was also in Dublin, so he, he worked there as well. It's still there in Phoenix Park, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland. But he, they still encountered issues because he was writing to the people that were in the field and they were writing back and they, were, they, couldn't pronounce, they couldn't pronounce the names, they couldn't spell the names, they couldn't write them down. So in the end, Thomas Larkham said, right, you're going yourself, you're going out on the road. So Donovan then set about going around the country. He went to the country, he says he's going to the country, to collect information repeated by persons who do not know how to write Irish. And he was sent out to ensure that the orthography of the remaining counties would be perfect as possible. So he was the only one trusted to do it. So part of the Ordnance Survey then expanded into um, what became the Ordnance Survey name books. So this is an example of, a, of a, a, an Ordnance Survey name book from, I think, County Cavan, I'm not sure. The place is called Ardnaglug anyway. So the people employed in the survey were to endeavour to obtain the correct orthography of the names of places by diligently consulting the best authorities within their reach. So the people employed um, to gather the names who were now in the field under the um, direction of John O'Donovan um, had to go out to talk to local people and gather the place names um, that were authoritative. So they didn't just go knocking on doors um, that were just randomly there. They consulted people who they thought had authority, so priests, first and foremost, that's where they went to. They talked to priests, they talked to doctors, they talked to people who had important jobs. And in the Ordnance Survey name books, they had a very standard layout. So what they did was they had the common spelling of the name. So this is Ardnaglug. You probably can't see it because it's a bit bright here. Then they had the ortho orthography, so when they were going around a district, they would record all the different forms of, that, of the spelling for that name. They would record the authority beside that. So this Ardnaglug here has been recorded by a guy called William, well, from a guy called William Corkley. Um, and then here, underneath the received name, John O'Donovan would, would come to a decision on what the standard form of that name would be. So now we have our maps, we have our Ordnance Survey memoirs, and we have our name books. When John O'Donovan was sent out to the field, um, and I suppose before he went to the field, they went in the other direction, um, he wrote lots of letters back and forth to the authorities in, in Phoenix Park, and they wrote to each other in the different districts that they were surveying. So the fourth set of resources um, that were produced at the time of the Ordnance Survey were what we call the Ordnance Survey letters. So field notes, commentaries, and correspondence to the OS headquarters in Phoenix Park. So these letters, not only contain um, information about the forms of names that were recorded in the standardized forms, but it also tells us a lot about their practices, where they were going, how they were traveling, where they were staying, who they were, where they, where they were meeting. So a way, it's like a diary entry into what John O'Donovan and his colleagues were doing on the field and what were they saying to each other. There was no text or email back then. Everything that was, um, any conversations between them were recorded um, and we have them in these letters. So like the memoirs, the Ordnance Survey letters are of broader interest, so they don't just have place information. They have really interesting summaries of place name lore, um, different stories behind the place names, origins of the place names, right or wrong, um, down to a very minute detail. And again, I'll get Barney to send these out so you can have a look at the example here. This one's an initial one, actually, I can read that at the top. In Donegal. Okay, so this is kind of like a, a midway or pre-midway point, is that in terms of the Ordnance Survey and the, pop, the material that was produced, we have four subsets of materials. We have our maps, the letters, the memoirs, and the Ordnance Survey name books. 
And this is kind of where the starting point is then for the Ordnance uh, Survey 200, the OS 200 project. So this is the project that I'm involved with at the minute um, that Barney alluded to at the start. So Ordin OS 200, um, within the context of the bicentenary of the Ordnance Survey, so we're coming up in 2024 to 200 years since um, Ireland, was, so the, since the Ordnance Survey started in Ireland. And the aim of the project is to gather um, all these different disparate bits, of bits and pieces from the Ordnance Survey that were never gathered together in one single place before. They're hidden away in libraries and different types of archives. Um, but what this project aims to do is to gather all these maps and texts and put them all in one place. So if somebody says, right, I want to know what the Ordnance Survey find about Kulka, and I want to see the maps, I want to see the letters, I want to see the name books, and I want to see the memoirs. The plan for this project is, is to have a, an online resource where you can just put in a place name, kind of like the place name project, but it will bring you up everything that we have um, left from the Ordnance Survey. So it's going to be a freely accessible online resource for academic and public use. Um, it's going to connect the maps with the memoirs, the letters, and the name books. So the plan then for this project is that the digital outcomes will not only advance our understanding of how Ireland was mapped 200 years ago, but also open up to wider and new audiences the legacies and the impacts of the Ordnance Survey, recognizing the lasting significance of what was accomplished and marking the bicentenary of its instigation. So that's the plan. Um, we're still in our first year for the project, so these types of engagement events are really going to form the direction of the project, and I'm going to ask for some help in that shortly. So thinking then about the four outputs of the Ordnance Survey, this is exactly how the project has planned to move forward. So we have four separate work packages that are mapped directly onto the four outputs of the Ordnance Survey. So work section one is the memoir, so we have up to four and a half million words, 1,600 drawings, so there will also be drawings and sketches in the memoirs. Um, for the name books, we have five case study border counties, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, the Ordnance Survey letters, there are 40 volumes of letters across Ireland, and then the six-inch maps. Um, we already have digitized map sheets um, for the whole island, but they're not incorporated with the rest of the data. So if um, anybody has, has anybody ever used the historical maps function? So Prony have these digitized already. You can go in, and you, uh, you can look at your town land map, um, and you can click through the different layers from the different editions of the Ordnance Survey map, but we're going to incorporate that into this wider database. But I want to talk about the name books because the name books um, are in various varying states through, across Ireland. So for the sake of this project, we thought well, we're not going to be able to do the whole of Ireland. Let's pick five counties along the border and do a, a sort of case study. So we thought, right, we'll do, um, what did it say? Cavan, Donegal, Fermanagh, Tyrone, and I can't remember what the last one was. Monaghan, somebody say Monaghan? I think, I can't, can't remember what the last one was. What was. Sorry? Leitrim. Leitrim. No, I don't think it was Leitrim. I don't think it was Leitrim. I can't remember. But anyway, that's, that's a separate point. So we've picked these five counties, and we thought, right, the Ordnance Survey name books, these handwritten ones that we saw a clip of before, these were typed up. Um, previously by uh, an individual called Father Michael Flanagan. So as far as we were aware, Father Michael Flanagan had typed all the name books up for the counties that we had decided that we were going to digitize for this project. So we went looking for them all, but which one could we not find? <coughs> the Fermanagh one could not be found anywhere. I, I was reaching out to descendants of O'Flanagan to try and find it. Could we find it where this, trans get a copy of this typed up transcripts from the Ordnance Survey name books of Fermanagh, but we couldn't get them. Um, and in the context where it couldn't be found, Muggins here was tasked with doing it, my, doing it myself. So I had a handwritten transcript from a previous researcher on the Place Name Project, um, and I spent the last three months or so typing up all the townlands of Fermanagh and all the forms. So this is one townland. So if you think about all the townlands of Fermanagh, and they all have at least this much information. I have been knee deep in Fermanagh since February. 
which is very apt for, for someone who had never been to Fermanagh. So I was driving along tonight going, I have heard of all these places and I've never been here before. But I was here in mind um, and nowhere else in the last couple of months. So that's why it's really nice to be here at a time when I've spent lots of time looking at place names in Fermanagh. Um, but we also now have a typed up version of all the name book texts for incorporation in our database. So we're creating a digital platform. That's the, that's the techie side that I'm not going to talk too much about because the other researchers in OB on the project, that's her, that's her bag. So in terms of the team, it's a highly interdisciplinary, um, inter, it's funded by a cross-border grant. So there are two host institutions, um, ourselves at Queen's and the University of Limerick. Um, we have linguists, we have geographers, we have historians, we have a computer scientist, all these different people that come from very different research interest backgrounds, but all have a real interest in what the Ordnance Survey can tell them for their own disciplines. So um, that's the team. Um, we also are working with um, different, um, I suppose, institutions. So the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin, uh, PRONI, uh, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and the DRI, the Digital Repository of Ireland, that are going to help us with storing these digitized um, components of the project. And so we're funded by uh, UKRI IRC, so North South Research um, Digital Humanities Cross Border um, Project. I think anything these days, if you want money for it, you have to say it's cross border and Bob's your uncle. So that's the team. Cat? Do you know Cat? Oh, no, it's a person's name. Oh, Cat Porter. <laughs> He, w he will love that. <laughs> so Kat is the equivalent of Keith in the South. Okay. Um, he might have a cat, I don't know, I'll ask him. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the project team. Um, and I have a bubble here with a question mark in it because there is uh, another, I suppose, collaborator, collaborator um, that needs to be included in here and that's really what these types of events are about because this team can do nothing in isolation if we don't have buy-in support and feedback and input from local communities. So this is where I'm going to come with the bag and bowl shortly. So what are the objectives of the project then in terms of, well we're creating a database but that's all well and good. You can create a database and put it on the website and nobody's going to look at it. Well we hope that by combining these different outputs of the Ordnance Survey that we can visualise historic mapping records. We're going to digitally link the various sources via place. So as I said previously, if you look up a place, you should be able to um, pull through all the different sources that refer to that place. In terms of language and uh, well, my interest in language, what do the name books and the sources in general tell us about the languages of 19th century Ireland? Because we know whenever these uh, researchers or these soldiers were going out into the fields, they met different types of people in different localities. So in places where um, Irish was still being spoken as a living language, the Ordnance Survey might be the only place that we have a record of Irish being spoken there. In a more wider context, what can this tell us about the legacies of overseas mapping by a colonial state because it was mapped in such detail? And by looking at the things like the, the letters, the Ordnance Survey letters and the memoirs, what can we learn about the practices of these people that were working for the Ordnance Survey in the field, you know, what did they do, where did they stay, what did they eat, where did they travel, you know, how, what, how did they work in the field and what can we learn from these documents um, that can kind of tell us what happened back then. So this is the theme then of talking places um, and we have this as a, as a general theme um, or I suppose um, starting point for talking about how we are going to engage with the materials. But I see it as kind of two ways. So I've got talking places one and I'll have talking places two. So talking places and talking to the Ordnance Survey materials, well this is really the creation of our database. So what, what can we learn from talking to these materials that have been locked away gathering dust for 200 years? Well this is our database. If we have any database people in the room or techie people, you'll understand what this means. I don't have a clue. It's something to do with shape files. But um, our technical research has told us that we were going to link, we are going to link our data using three key indices. So they're going to be linked by person or people. 
They're going to be linked by place and linked by event. So all the different sources are going to be linked by those three different themes running through the database. And partly this tells you the story of the, the hierarchy. So by doing this, we can link the various ordnance survey outputs to each other um, with these headings or these themes. But we also have the potential then to link to other data sets. So like, for example, the data set of the Northern Ireland Place Name Project, the Loganium um, Project, which is, the, I suppose, the kind of equivalent Place Name Project in the South. We also know that um, there is huge potential with linking with the Northern Ireland Sites and Monuments Records, because obviously lots of these um, old forts and different um, old buildings or sites of archaeological interest are on the Sites and Monuments record. So there, there'd be possibilities for linking those other databases in with this structure. But keeping these three things in mind, people, places, and events. Thinking about these thematic he headings, what kind of things can we pull out from, from the Ordnance Survey, or do we plan to pull out from it? Well, the first index is the People Index. So we plan to create a list of all people who are referenced or involved in the survey. So that includes surveyors, um, people that were informants, people that were mentioned in the, the various documents. Um, building as two tables so we can track groups as well as differences in names, so we can track groups of individuals. This is what the database is going to be able to do. So this will enable us to look at things like who is the source for a piece of information, and the gender of authors, um, the rank of the people that were consulted or the people that were doing the consulting, thinking back about the um, authorities that were consulted, you know, what, how many of the People consulted were members of the clergy, many of them were teachers. You know, what kind of uh, jobs did the people have that were consulted, but in a way that we can pull this out and do some sort of analysis on it. And this is just one example um, of, I suppose, John O'Donovan, the main man of the Ordnance Survey. Strangely, depending on where he was, he signed his name in a different way. So these both extracts are from 1835. The top one is from an OS letter in County Armagh. And he has it here in Irish orthography, Celtic orthography, Sean O'Donovan, which is John O'Donovan. In the exact same year, in County Monaghan, he writes to John O'Donovan. Looks like a different hand. So what, what can this tell us about um, how he saw himself in these different counties um, and, and attitudes towards the, the types of ways things were written down? So, as I said, I've been knee-deep in Fermanagh, in Belfast, um, for the last couple of months. But I've been thinking about how these different um, indexes, people, place, and event, can um, draw out things of interest from the Fermanagh name books. So here's an example of, um, this is what the name books look like now that I've typed them up. So we have the given name, all the different forms, all the different authorities, and then sometimes a little bit more information. So this is the entry for Killy Hevelin, Townland. And I've extracted what he's, typed, what he's written underneath here. So this is O'Donovan. So Captain Gabbett is obviously the, the soldier who's been collecting these names. And he has provided an interpretation of it. And he says, Captain Gabbett thinks that this means kill the thieve Linya, the church near the stream, but he is surely wrong. So you have these little encounters between John O'Donovan and the surveyors in these documents that really can tell us more about what was going on between them at the time. Um, so we have this individual thought it was Kill the Thievelin, yeah. um, We also know now with having more information, it's Killy Havelin or Havelin's Wood. Um, and we can also see here that Killy Havelin was the residence of Mr. Dean. We have an X there. R ask me, remind me at the end if I don't come back to that. So we have an X. Uh, Lord, is Lord Belmore planted? Portion of East Boundary runs through Loch Arne. So different bits of information um, linked to people. These are some other people that appear in the Fermanagh name books. So apparently there is, sorry, a man named Smith died five years ago at the advanced age of 132 years. Do we have any Smiths in the room? Because they come from a good line. His brother is now teaching a small school for his support, aged 100. So your man's starting teaching at 100. I need to find a Mr. Smith while I'm here in Fermanagh. Um, so again, these types of individuals will be tagged in the database for, for be, as being people, and then these types of stories can be pulled out. Another one, um, we have a reference to uh, proprietor E. Averne, the Earl of Erne, who owned 
a lot of land, according to this, uh, the name books. But in one of the entries, O'Donovan writes he's a lunatic. <laughs> he doesn't write it all the time. He must just be a lunatic when he's in that townland. So that was Ken Ollie. So there are lots of little interesting snippets of information about the people of this county and the other counties that were surveyed from 200 years ago. Um, maybe somebody knows another lunatic um, in Fermanagh, maybe. But we might, we might come back to that. <laughs> so the second index then is going to be the place index. So why is this going to be useful? Well, it will code each instance of a place name on a page. So we can link this to other data, so, such as the information from the memoirs, visits to particular sites that are in the memoirs. So for example, if you have a, a name book that contains a townland, well, that townland might appear in a, in a memoir or somewhere else um, that having those link will facilitate you being able to see them side by side. Um, it can link information to a place and to scans and to the maps. Um, and looking at place names alternatives, so looking at the quality of alternatives, so whenever names are spelled to a different way. The best example of that, when I talked about standardization earlier, I was saying they wanted to have the same form for every name. So the Irish word for um, an island is Inish. So we see lots of Inish Moore, Inish Free, Inish Owen, but in Ennis Gillen it became Ennis. So that's the type of thing they were trying to avoid. But this place index would maybe try and, and group those different anglicizations together. So things that might be interesting for the place index is, for example, here. This is from the place name website. So we have Kenali P, parish. Kenali T, townland, because we very often had a name replicated as the name of a, of a parish and of a townland. And then we also have Kenali rectory. So by linking the um, sources via place, we'll be able to pull out parallel information about a particular place um, and then obviously cite that on the map. So here's an example of a place that we could maybe include in the index. Majors Bridge, does anybody know where Majors Bridge is? Yeah. So three quarter miles from Lisnes Ski, um, by another road and he changed his mind to on the road to Maguire's Bridge. Um, and then there was another bridge here, Yale's Bridge. Does anybody know where Yale's Bridge is? So the Yale's Bridge wasn't on the 1 to 10,000 map to Maguire's Bridge, but over the same river as Maguire's Bridge. Yale's Bridge is bounded by, here we go, we have a question mark, so the question mark goes with the X as well. Um, Townland of Tulin, Parish of Ahave. So these are examples from the name book. So places that are referenced that may be on the historic maps that might not be in, in the public space now, or vice versa. So this is a, a picture of Majors Bridge from the first edition Ordnance Survey 6-inch map. Events then, um, what can we gain from linking events in the database? Well, we can look at site visits. We can see how surveyors are moving across the landscape. Um, we can maybe add a table for if we want to replicate the same events or visit the same places now. Um, in terms of local informants and sources, when were they consulted? When were these names gathered? That will also help us with the uh, tracking of the, the shift from Irish to English. Uh, what sites had more written sources, um, which ones had more oral sources, um, reconstructing historical events as understood by surveyors, can we compare this to how we understand the events happen today um, or find in an event. So um, here is an example of um, tracking an event. Yes, yeah, so this name was recorded. Um, this isn't from Anna, I'm not sure where this one's from, I think Monaghan. Lower Kildrum, Kildrum Narrow Ridge. So O'Donovan has written, this should be Keeldrum by right, but the Scotch pronunciation prevails too far here. So this is telling you about language at this particular time when this was recorded. Um, another event that might be interesting to, to tag when we're pulling our events together, this is um, Mullen Sugar. Well, I really butchered that one, didn't I? Um, so in this town, I'm not going to try and repeat, um, we have uh, an event listed, so um, E of Iron, this is the lunatic, so he has this one as well. He's a property, uh, proprietor of this one. The soil was light and sandy, planted with forest trees, blah, blah, blah. No lease since the death of his late majesty. So what did the death of the king in England, um, what effect did that have on, on how the Ordnance Survey was carried out, or how the land was leased and not leased and transferred between people? So this is an event that we can... Um, we can tag in the database to learn more about how events shaped um, the mapping of the time. So, 
I've talked about talking places one, so talking to the sources, talking to the place name books, talking to the maps. But in terms of the project and our um, keenness, I suppose, to engage with communities in the areas that were mapped at the time, the second component of talking places is talking to the people. It's events just like this. So here we have a little blue dot with the question marks. So this is how you fit into the project team um, as we move forward. So talking to people is one of the ways that we're going to be really able to enhance this database um, and also enhance the activities associated with the project. So you might recognize some of the people in this picture. This is one of Barney's pictures, I think. So how can we, as a project, this is my, my begging bowl coming out, how can we enlist the help of and tap into the expertise of local communities in exploring the legacy of the OS in Ireland, and in particular for here for Fermanagh? Thinking again about these three themes that we've identified that are going to be key in the database. Person or people, place and event. So I suppose looking ahead then and, and revisiting the objectives of the project, so we have um, visual, uh, visualizing the historic networks, digital link, linkage of places, uh, learning about language in 19th century Ireland. I've already learned in the last 24 hours that there was a Gaeltacht, not far from here until very recently, an Irish speaking area. So I'm, I'm already learning stuff. Um, the insights on how the Ordnance Survey operated across Ireland, um, reflecting the legacies of colonial states and the processes and practices of the Ordnance Survey locally. So thinking about the Ordnance and practices of the Ordnance Survey locally, we might look at uh, an extract from one of the letters that they said they got from A to B. And the city girl from Belfast would just go, ah, that's the way they went. But somebody who is from the area will say, well, there's no way you're going to walk that way because you're going to fall down that ditch or that angry bull is going to run you over or those types of local bits of information that you wouldn't know that you would be able to say, well, if I was here 200 years ago, I would have went this way or I would have went that way or I would have chosen not to go at all and maybe guess what was at the top. So. We're planning to um, uncover hidden and forgotten aspects of the life and work of those employed by the Ordnance Survey and in turn uncover hidden and forgotten aspects of the localities of the place because this really is a place-based project. Um, re reconstruct an ethnography of the Ordnance Survey, so looking in detail at the movements of individuals, their links with others and informants and looking at the time and geography of these movements. So, could we look at the time of year that they visited certain places? And you know, what, can you go up to Kilka and to the top in December? I don't know. Um, but this is all types of things that we can track in the memoirs and in the other sources and then explore um, 200 years on. Um, and we also plan then to um, open up the map and the other sources to new audiences, but also explore the legacy and impacts of the Ordnance Survey recognizing the lasting significance of what was accomplished and marking the bicentenary of its instigation. So I suppose it's a, it's a celebration, but it's a fact-finding mission of, of the legacy of the Ordnance Survey. So this is a loosely shaped plan um, that we came up with at, at a conference a couple of weeks ago when we were uh, chatting afterwards. So the plan might be is to recreate a or retrace the steps of the Ordnance Survey. So this is the map that I showed you earlier with all the trigonometry points at the top. So we have Sleeve League, Kulka, Vickers Cairn, Sleeve Donner, Divis, Loch Foyle, Sowell, Truston, Knocklade. So those are the, the points. So there they are there. I should have just read them off that. So the plan is, well, why don't we just retrace the steps of where these trig stations were and use these as the focus points for the, the engagement component of the project which means we get to come back to Kilka. But also, you guys are in a very privileged position in that we're not going anywhere else to ask them what they want to do. You guys get to set the pitch for the whole thing. So I'm nearly finished, but these are some of the ideas that we've got. So you can start thinking about what you would like to do when we come back or what you would like for us to do when we come back. I'm sure Barney will have something to say about this. So we've thought about, should we do guided walks or guided tours or follow the footsteps of the surveyors you know, that, that are mapped out in the documents? We also had a bit of a crazy idea of doing a, a, an OS 200 time capsule. So if you remember I showed you the Ordnance Survey name book, could we give you a wiped out version of that and ask you to fill it in for your timeline today and then maybe compare what your timeline was like then and what your timeline is like now? Um, and then maybe locking that up for 200 years time for OS 400. Um, 
would you be interested in doing mapping sessions, you know, exploring, annotating maps, perhaps getting a blank map of your district and recording minor names or field names? Um, an EHA Arneal is an idea that I came up with, if anybody's uh, familiar with the topic of an EHA Arneal. Um, in Irish speaking districts, they would, the community would have got together and literally told stories. So would this be a way that we could share the stories of the district um, by getting together um, in the pub and talking, talking about the area? Would we like to do talks or quizzes? Or would you be interested, or would, do you think others would be interested in doing a workshop, maybe transcribing or translating? And here we have filling in the blanks, and this is where I want to reference what I said earlier about the question marks and the little x. So when I was transcribing another person's transcription of the Ordnance Survey name books, obviously because they were handwritten and some of them in quite poor quality, there are a lot of blanks. So we have spaces where the land in such and such is such and such, you know, would we be able to tap into the, the local, or I suppose we could if, if, if it was going to be interesting, come with the, the Ordnance Survey transcripts as we have them and say, what do you think was in the, in the, in the middle here? Um, you know, the land is blank in winter, you know, was it flooded, was it dry, was it uninhabitable? Those types of information gathering sessions would be useful for us to help us try and fill in the blanks for the, the sources that we've only been able to take so far. So at the end, when we get a cup of tea, you'll see my really snazzy <laughs> handwritten board at the back. So all these little circles that have the ideas, there's little sheets of stickers. So grab a sheet of stickers or grab a couple of stickers and stick them in the circle of the thing that you would like to do most. You can do more than one, you can do them all, you can do not at all. And I've also left a marker there. If there's anything else that you, as the experts of the area, and also people with a, with a buy-in to this project, and, and a, I suppose a, an op opportunity to help us steer it in a particular direction for our community engagement, are there any other things that we could do together um, to, to explore the legacy of the Ordnance Survey in Fermanagh? So I guess that's me finished. I don't know if I'm over or under time, Barney, am I okay? Spot on, there we go. Um, so just to finish up, we'll get questions, we'll get a cup of tea. We have a website for the project, but it's really complicated. So go to Google and Google OS200 project and it'll bring you straight there. Um, this is just the, the, the link that they gave us. We're on Twitter, and that's what it looks like on the website. When you get to there, you know we're at the right, right website. My email is on the first slide. Um, I can ask Barney to to share the slides. Anybody who's left their email address, he can um, forward these on so you can have a proper look at some of the, I just want to make sure my email is here. Yep, f.kane at qub.ac.uk. Um, so that's me pretty much finished. Thanks for listening. Um,